Okay, so uh, so far we've been discussing uh, techniques for two-dimensional imaging uh, for measuring deformations, uh, specifically for uh, measuring strains and displacements. So digital image correlation was something we discussed at length. Uh, we'll change track a little bit and move on to another technique that I introduced at the very beginning called photoelasticity. Now, um, photoelasticity is a very old technique. It's been around for a very long time. Uh, as a phenomenon, it was identified a very long time ago, and uh, it's also been exploited quite a bit uh, for uh, mechanics for studying deformations, stresses, uh, and so on. And um, so, some of the stuff that we will discuss are fairly well known. Uh, at the very end, I'll discuss a technique called integrated photoelasticity, which is a little bit more contemporary. It was developed maybe in the 70s and 80s, uh, which deals with three-dimensional fields. Now, photoelasticity just like DIC is also an essentially two dimensional technique, but instead of relying on um, strains and displacements, it directly measures or gives you an estimate of the stresses. Okay. Now, um, if you have seen uh, photoelastic fringes or if you have seen uh, glass within what are called polarizer sheets, you probably have seen colorful patterns and images and so on uh, before, even if you have not heard the term photoelasticity. You've probably seen um, some variant of this at some point in your life. Uh, for example, if you're if you've worn sunglasses, uh, you've seen a polarizer directly, and you know what the effect of the polarizer is. It cuts off some of the radiation and so on. So um, essentially, this phenomenon draws on several disciplines and uh, puts all of that together for extracting information. So today, I'll just start with an introduction to what photoelasticity is for those of you who are uninitiated. And uh, then we will slowly build up some of the um, techniques, some of the basic principles and some of the mathematics uh, behind how to interpret uh, stress fields and so on, fringes and obtain stress fields and so on. So the idea is very simple, you have an object uh, which is a replica so of typically uh, photoelasticity at least historically it has been used for um, uh, studying stresses in objects uh, which are otherwise optically opaque. So, for example, if you had uh, let us say if you had a actual object, so this is your actual object and it was subject to some loads let us say like this and you wanted to know what the stress field is inside. Okay. <clears throat> now, notice we are asking what the stress field is not what the deformation field is. So, this directly relates to the properties of the object and typically when you say stress field you are talk, talking mainly about elastic stresses. Some of this has been extended for um, uh, slightly other situations residual stresses for example, which are also elastic, but have a slightly different um, uh, complication, we will talk about it briefly at the end. But uh, you want to know what the elastic stresses are in the material and your interest in this perhaps is to see if under this particular loading condition whether this uh, body fails, whether it yields and so on and that is of practical interest. So for instance, this could be an aircraft wing subject to some type of forces, just making it up. Uh, and you want to know if any part of the wing fails or any part of the wing yields right and if it yields that means plastic deformation is going to start occurring there more and more, it is going to accumulate more and more and which means that eventually that part will be or that section of the wing will be where failure will start, where cracks will start and so on. So uh, <clears throat> this was historically why photoelasticity was used um, and people would make a smaller scale version of this, something that looked like this. And this would be made out of an optically transparent material. And then you would subject this to the same forces scaled down of course, as the original model and then you would see if the stresses here exceeded the yield strength and so on. Right? So this was used as an experimental way for um, determining the elastic stresses in an object. Now, subsequently 
uh, quite a few other applications have emerged. So, for instance, if you have a, a piece of glass, let us say you made a thick window glass. Okay, for some space application let us say and it has to sit inside a hub like this. So, this is the hole inside which the glass is placed and it is completely sealed in let us say with some silicone sealant or something. You want to know if this glass has any residual stress inside which means uh, when the glass was being made was it made in such a way that there were stresses baked inside the glass uh, which could affect the performance of the glass. So, for instance, if this was the window of an airplane, so you had a or a window of a space shuttle, it looked like this let us say in the top view and if you had let me draw the three dimensional view actually, if this was your glass and if uh, let us say you had some projectile come and hit the glass from the outside, then this will tell you whether this glass will fail under this type of projectile impact or whether it will survive this type of projectile impact, what types of projectile impacts it could survive and under what conditions will it fail right. So, things like this are not easy to determine uh, from strain fields, but they are relatively easy to determine from stress fields right. So, that is why photoelasticity becomes uh, important in a situation like this. Now, incidentally this is allied to the field of what is called tempering. Most of you if you have a metallurgy if you have taken a course in metallurgy uh, physical metallurgy you probably are aware of this term, um, but tempering is also done for glasses there is something called thermal tempering and something called chemical tempering and uh, basically tempering induces residual stress and so there are various ways of controlling what the stress distribution is actually. Um, what the stress distribution actually is in the glass um, and measuring it using photoelasticity. So, that gives you some background for where some of these techniques find use. Uh, we will discuss a little bit more as we go along, uh, but first we will show you a few videos of uh, typical glass samples and what tempered glass looks like, what thermally tempered glass looks like or thermally toughened that is another phrase that is often used toughened glass. And if you look at this through two sheets, we will call them polarizer sheets again within quotes, I will discuss what these are, what they are useful for and so on. But if you take a piece of glass like this, I am now going to draw the side view, this view and if you put one of these polarizer sheet over here and another polarizer sheet analogous polarizer sheet here and then you put a light source here and you look from here, then you will see a fringe pattern through the glass right and the fringe pattern will depend on whether the glass is toughened, whether it is thermally toughened, whether it is chemically toughened, untoughened, untreated and so on right. So, we will show you some of these uh, next, so that you at least have some idea of what this looks, what this stuff looks like practically before we start a more detailed discussion uh, of this phenomenon. So, let us look at some examples of photoelasticity. So, for this demonstration I have this linear polarizer sheet and some glass samples which are prepared differently. So, based on the orientation of this uh, polarizer sheet we will see that the fringes which are representative of the stress in the glasses will change and you will see the details of why this happens and what the, all this represents in coming lectures. So, the glasses shown on the screen although they all look the same, but if we just put this glasses uh, under the polarizer sheets, we will see that their stress states are different. Glass number 1 is a normal glass which has no stress state inside, while glass number 2 is a thermally tempered glass. So, when we put this glass in between polarizer sheet, we will see that all colored fringes appear. And third and fourth glass are toughened with a with a different process, which is called as chemical tempering. So we'll see all these glasses one by one in between polarizer sheets, and we will compare 
and see the difference what happens when we rotate the polarizer sheet in different orientations. So the configuration that I am showing you on the screen on the left I have a normal glass while on the right I have a glass which is thermally tempered and there are two sheets one on the below which is polarizer and on the top there is one more linear polarizer sheet which is called as analyzer and we are passing white light through this sheets and observing from the top using a camera. So we can see that there are different colorful fringes appearing on the thermally tempered glass that is because of stresses which are trapped in this glass. Now if we just rotate this sheet to a slightly different orientation that is 45 degree to the like bottom sheet we can see that this fringe patterns are changing. Now when we go in detail of this of why this happened and what this implies this will be covered in our upcoming lectures and also this orientations gives us the information about direction of the principal stresses in this glass samples. Now let us look at what happens when we keep a chemically tempered glass in the same configuration. So on the left we have chemically tempered glass while on the right we have thermally tempered glass. We can see that depending upon the stress state again we are getting two different type of fringe patterns. Now the next uh, sample that I am showing you is a very interesting uh, and uh, very famous sample. This are called as Rupert's drops. So these are basically glass drops which are solidified by melting the glass and dropping that molten glass into, into water. So because of this rapid cooling what happens on this solidification that stresses get stabbed inside and this drops show very different properties. So when this glass drop uh, head is hit by hammer they don't break but if you just split the tail of this drop this drops shatters into fragments instantly. So we can see that when we keep these drops in between this polarizer sheets uh, there are fringes in the drops which represent the stresses which are trapped inside the drop. So on the surface of this uh, drops which is uh, uh, compressive in nature uh, while inside there are tensile stresses. So when crack reaches the tensile region it grows and instantly the drop shatters into fragments. So this simple experiment showed you how you can visualize the stresses using photoelasticity. Now analysis of this stresses in detail will be there in following lectures.